Hello and welcome, I'm your host, Swing Ashburgus, and today we will be reacting to Oversimplified Parts 1 and 2 of World War II. Hmm, let's see how accurate this guy is. ...from Italy to Switzerland to avoid military service. He gets big into socialism, working for trade unions, writing for socialist newspapers, advocating a violent overthrow of European monarchies, the whole shebang. This gets him in a bit of trouble with the Swiss police, so he gets arrested, sent back to Italy, set free, returns to Switzerland, is arrested again, goes back to Italy again, completes his military service after previously avoiding it, and then after a brief stint as an elementary school teacher, he finally returns to work as an avid socialist. His speeches and journalistic abilities made him famous among Italian socialists. He was anti-war, so when Italy colonized Libya in 1910, he rioted and got arrested. <laughs> then World War I came along, and once again, he protested Italy's involvement. But then he thought, wait a minute, this war could bring about the social climate needed to overthrow European monarchies and bring about the <sighs> socialist revolution everywhere. And suddenly he was pro-war, but his fellow socialists didn't like his new pro-war stance. So they kicked him out of the party. So then he said, you know what? I'm done with socialism. We need something new, not based on class divisions tearing us apart, but based on unity through nationality. We'll conquer the Mediterranean and reunite all Italian people, just like the days of the Roman Empire. I'll call it fascismo, and it will guide the Italian nation to greatness. That's all well and good, Mr. Mussolini. But what kind of haircut? <laughs> Let's go with... Oh, oh God. Oh my lord. everything the german people loved it hitler had been a soldier during world war one and he was crazy patriotic and nobody was madder than him about germany's humiliation he helped start a new political party and in 1923 attempted a march on munich with his boys and then he got arrested <laughs> 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 it's Japan, and they've taken over northern China. Let's rewind a bit. Japan had isolated itself from the rest of the world for over 200 years until the Americans showed up and said, You're going to trade with us, and you're going to like it. Then the Nope. And they took a bunch of China's stuff. But then the West said, Hey, Cut that out. And since Japan couldn't take on the West, they said, okay, I guess we'll just go home. Wait a minute, what are you doing? Taking advantage of a weakened China and setting up spheres of influence. But I was the one who weakened them. We know. And you guys didn't let me have anything. We know. That seemed unfair. We don't think so. <laughs> okay, see ya. So Japan thought, screw this, and went to war with Russia, and stunned everyone by actually winning. Then they well, Russia was under the confidence of, uh, uh, you know, Nicholas the second. Bomb up a Japanese train in Manchuria, giving them an excuse to launch an invasion and take over. So here's the situation. Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, and Japan all believe they're racially superior, all feel hostility towards the Allies, and all want to militarize and take over more stuff. And so they did. Let's start with Germany. Hitler hated the Treaty of Versailles, and now he was ready to begin on doing it. In complete violation of the treaty, the first Luftwaffe squadrons were set up, conscription was introduced, and he pimped up his army. The Allies did nothing. Then Hitler sent his army back into the demilitarized Rhineland, giving orders to immediately retreat if the Allies showed up. The Allies did nothing. With his military restrengthened, 
he could now move on to step two. He wanted to rapidly increase the Aryan population, and to do so, he needed Levin's Rome. Or in other words, he would have to take over the world. But for now, a good portion of Europe would do, and he began eyeing up his neighbors. The Allies finally started to get worried, so they implemented a fairly useless diplomatic strategy called appeasement. And it <laughs> a little something like this. Hitler would say, I want that thing. And the Allies would say, you can't have that thing. Okay, you can have that thing, but no more. I want that thing. And repeat. In 1938, Hitler's army marched into Austria and just took it with no resistance. Period. The Allies held a meeting with Hitler in Munich and said, Look, we're going to give you what. Hang on, this meeting is about my territory. Shouldn't I come to the meeting too? <laughs> anyway, we're going to give you what you want. Really? Yeah. Just like that? Yep. What's the catch? Just sign this piece of paper promising you won't invade the rest of Czechoslovakia. Okay. Then Chamberlain returned from victorious, waving his signed piece of paper in the air, declaring crisis to be averted and the continuation of world peace. And we built a statue of Chamberlain in his honor, and every day on the 30th of September we celebrate Chamberlain Day. Hitler's invading the rest of Czechoslovakia. <laughs> 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 also wanted to get in on the action. He thought to himself, isn't there a not yet colonized nation somewhere which is so So they occupied Albania. Then, in another incident which was maybe staged by the Japanese, probably <laughs> by Japanese and Chinese troops at the Marco Polo Bridge. And the Japanese launched yet another invasion against China. They set up in Shanghai and then advanced to the Yangtze Valley to China's then capital, Nanking. It was Where they raped the worst people a little too hard. Atrocities committed against the Chinese people. Back in Europe, Germany and Italy made their relationship status official by signing the Pact of Steel. Then, Hitler turned his eyes towards Poland and the hated Polish corridor splitting Germany in two. At this point, the Allies really had to put their foot down. <laughs> and that an invasion of Poland would mean war. Hitler had planned to continue his advance eastward, but he didn't want to end up fighting a war on two fronts. So for now, he made an alliance with Stalin, saying, How about we both invade Poland and split it between the two of us? And I definitely won't not refrain from not betraying him sometime in the future. Sounds... Good. <laughs> this new alliance stunned the West. On the 1st of September 1939, German troops entered Poland, and Britain and France declared war on Germany. The Poles fought hard, but they were no match for the two giants crashing down on them from either side. Then came a period known as the Phony War, where everyone just sort of sat around not doing much. <laughs> The French had launched a small invasion into the Saarland, but they maintained mostly defensive positions, and after a while, decided to just turn around and call it a day. Speaking of France, the French were still super proud of their victory in World War I, and they hadn't really moved on from it. They still had <laughs> forces, they dispatched messages by motorbike instead of using radio, orders from the commander-in-chief were usually pretty vague, and the troops were rarely inspected. They built a line of defenses along their German border, but didn't bother extending it all the way to the Channel, and they wouldn't launch artillery strikes against Germany out of fear of being retaliated against. In a war, they didn't want to attack the enemy. And at first, the UK wasn't much better. Chamberlain still naively hoped that the war could be ended diplomatically. Instead of bombing raids, the RAF dropped propaganda leaflets over German cities, which one air marshal said likely did nothing but provide the continent with toilet paper for yeah. the duration of the war. They also only sent 200,000 men to France, while the French had mobilized millions. Both Britain and France wanted to avoid a repeat of the First World War, and so they wanted to keep the war as far from home as possible. So they turned their eyes north, towards Norway. Neutral Sweden was exporting iron ore to Germany through neutral Norway, so the Allies asked them if they could please stop exporting iron ore to Germany, but this request was refused. Then, the Soviet Union attacked Finland, so the Allies said, how about we land troops in Norway and move them across Sweden to go help out your good pal Finland, and along the way maybe take control of all your armfields. But Norway and Sweden still said no, so the Allies the waters around Norway to force any transport ships into international waters, and they also attacked That's an act of found in the area. Hitler realized what the Allies were up to, and he quickly moved to secure his supply of iron ore. He launched an invasion through Denmark into Norway. The Allies rushed to land troops at keyports along the coast, but Germany had taken control of Norway's airfield, and their air superiority decided the fight. The Allies had to retreat. After this slightly embarrassing failure, Chamberlain resigned and was replaced with Winston Churchill, who had a slightly different approach to <laughs> Hitler's overall strategy was similar to Germany's First World War strategy. Attack France, defeat France, knocking out the UK in the process, then turn on the Soviet Union and win the war. During the phony war, the Allies had given Hitler time to prepare his forces. Now, he was ready to attack. The Allies had wanted to place troops in Belgium, but Belgium had refused, and in a move that surprised pretty much... How about we ain't doing this again? Defenses. The Allies charged into Belgium at full 
Germany's feet to meet the German invasion head on, and it looked like a repeat of the First World War was coming. But this time, Hitler had a trick up his sleeve. Blitzkrieg. As the Germans advanced, they sent thousands of refugees westward, slowing down the Allies. Then, to the south, the French had left the Ardennes, an area full of hills and forests, pretty underdefended because they thought it was naturally <laughs> impenetrable. Well, the Germans were about to penetrate it with... Penetrate it. Wow. ...and encircled the Allied army at speed. The best yeah. of the Allied forces were now trapped. The Germans Oops. squeezed it from all sides, taking out France's best armies and nearly wiping out the British, too. But they managed to make a desperate last-minute escape at Dunkirk, with British civilian ships even making the perilous journey mm -hmm. to bring their young men home. With most of the French forces depleted, the Germans breezed through, taking Paris, and France fell. What the Germans could have done in World yep. War I, Hitler had done just like that. Hitler hoped that with the fall of France, the UK would also lose hope and sue for peace. But quite annoyingly, it didn't, and he needed to secure the Western Front. So he tried to force them into submission with mind games. The UK were now all alone, and Hitler wanted to emphasize that. First of all, just before France fell, Italy finally declared war on the Allies, making the UK's situation even worse. Next, instead of just occupying all of France, Hitler occupied the coastal areas for defense, but allowed France to continue its existence as a German puppet state. This way, it looked like the UK's old ally had decided to switch sides. Hitler Hitler also hoped that the UK wouldn't attack any of her old allies' navy bases or colonies in Africa, giving Hitler an extra line of defense to the south. But the UK made sure to respond to this by sailing down to France's navy base in Algeria and wrecking a bunch of ships. So have at it. Hitler <laughs> then began laying down plans for an invasion of Great Britain. Fascinating. air and naval superiority across the channel. Waves of German bombers came, while the completely outnumbered RAF worked bravely around the clock in an attempt to quell the German attacks. At first, the Luftwaffe targeted British ports and coastal facilities. Then it attacked RAF bases, crippling the RAF's ability to defend the nation. And it looked like Hitler's Great British invasion was coming. But then, Churchill ordered a small, pretty insignificant bombing raid over Berlin. It didn't do much damage, but Hitler was furious, and he immediately ordered ordered the Luftwaffe to refocus its attacks on civilian targets in London. Children were sent off to the countryside, away from their parents to avoid danger, and frequent trips to air raid shelters became a daily occurrence. But British morale held firm. Smiling, knitting, lounging casually, these people have balls of stuff. <laughs> 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 Take that, Atifa! kind of shot himself in the foot there. Just the foot for now. Finally, the Just to flip for now. All out attack on London, and the RAF successfully repelled it, destroying many of the German aircraft and placing air superiority firmly in British hands. Hitler's invasion had to be postponed, but the bombing of British cities continued for some time. This video was made possible by Skillshare, an online learning community. Stick around until the end of the video to learn how you can get an exclusive deal just for oversimplified viewers. So what else is happening? Well, when I said Britain is all alone, that wasn't entirely true. Many Commonwealth nations and other allied colonies had joined the war in Britain's support. They would play a key role throughout the war, particularly in the African and Italian campaigns. On the Axis side, Germany, Italy, and Japan signed a defensive tripartite pact, bringing their military alliance even closer together. The Soviet Union's war against Finland should have been an easy victory, but it became a humiliating struggle, and the military ineptitude was put on full display. In the end, Damn they the defense to sue for peace. Then, they continued their honorable campaign of pushing around much smaller countries by annexing the Baltic states and part of northern Romania. France's colonies in equatorial Africa were like, heck no, we aren't going to join the Germans, and they all pledged their allegiance to free France, except for Gabon, which had to be taken by military force. The Allies also tried to capture the strategic port of Dakar, but that ended in failure. Mussolini had several <laughs> successes, and he thought now it was Italy's time to shine, so he tried to take British Somaliland, and that went pretty well. Then he tried to take Egypt, and that went less well. Then he tried to take Greece, and that went really badly. Churchill began referring to Italy as Europe's soft underbelly. <laughs> oh, burn. He began favoring a military campaign from the south and started sending British troops to Greece. All of this had Hitler pretty concerned, and he moved to... What the fuck, man? He the army to signing the Tripartite Pact and joining the Axis powers. Romania was also eager to join for protection against the Soviet Union. The Tripartite Pact was designed to prevent any other countries from deciding... Early NATO, ah. Specifically, Britain's old ally, the pesky United States of America. When war first broke out, American public opinion was strongly against joining in. In 1940, <laughs> there was an election. The Republican candidates said they were not sending any young Americans to die in Europe. And sitting President Franklin D. Roosevelt said, I will... Also, not telling Americans to die in Europe. Unless I have to, then I might. And Roosevelt warned <laughs> to join the war. Roosevelt said, No can do, Winston. But you know what? 
Here, have some weapons. America began supplying the Allies with food and munitions, <laughs> but there was one problem. German U-boats were sinking thousands of Allied supply ships in the Atlantic, including American ones. If the Germans could sever Britain's supply line, the UK would starve. Throughout the war, the Allies had to come up with better technology to fight the U-boats. Mm -hmm. Radar, aircraft with longer range, better weaponry and convoy tactics. At one point, the man even called a meeting and said, Hey, Pete, you take some wood, you take some ice, you put them together, you get pikecrete. And then he pulled out a gun and shot some wood and it shattered. And then he shot some pikecrete and the bullet ricocheted off it and hit someone else in the conference room. And then they tried to make a pikecrete aircraft carrier, but that idea was scrapped because that's a really dumb idea. Yeah. Alan and his team of code breakers cracked Germany's Enigma code, and the U-boats gradually became less and less of a threat. Back in Africa, nice. they decided to push Italy out of Egypt. Hey, that was pretty easy, so they kept going. Hitler realized he was going to have to find. Seriously, what the fuck, man? Yugoslavia and said, "Hey, I'm going to move troops through you to get to Greece. So either join us or, you know, be invaded." Bulgaria opted to join them. Yugoslavia opted to be invaded. Then Greece <laughs> finally fell to the joint. German Italian invasion. The British had moved troops from North Africa to fight in Greece, which helped Rommel and his tank divisions push the British back to Egypt, and they could have kept going, but a small, mostly Australian force held out under <laughs> for eight months into Brook, denying the Germans a strategic port city and disrupting their supply line. Despite having some success in the Middle East, the British didn't seem like any real threat for now. Hey, <laughs> Soviet Union, look out! With three million troops, Hitler launched the largest ground invasion in history, and Stalin was far from ready. Both Churchill and Roosevelt had warned him of an impending attack, but he dug his head in the sand, and the Soviets didn't stand mm -hmm. up. Germany made staggering progress, with huge encircling movements capturing mind-boggling numbers of Russian troops. A quarter million at Bialystok, Minsk, 300,000 at Smolensk, nearly 700,000 at Kiev, and again at Vyazma and Bransk. Leningrad was put under a siege that would last an insufferable four years. The invasion of Russia had been Hitler's main ideological goal from the beginning, and his hatred for the ethnic peoples there was now unleashed in all its fury. The Eastern Front of the Second World War was brutal for all that endured it. The Germans were now inside of Moscow, and that's it. It's all over. But then it happened. It got cold. Stupid cold. Yeah. Cold as winter in a long time. His commanders came to him and said, Can we please dig in for the winter and wait until spring? No. Keep going. But oil is literally freezing inside our vehicles. That's fine. Keep going. We're having to leave the corpses of our frozen horses by the side of the road so we can still find a way in the snow drift. Perfectly normal. Keep going. Hitler hadn't given his millions of men winter clothes and supplies because he thought he really should have won by now. Then, Stalin called in troops from the Siberian front, specially trained to fight in the extreme cold, and the Germans <laughs> were no match. They were now being pushed back. They had no choice but to dig in and wait for winter to end. Germany's victories were staggering, and Japan was eager not to miss the victory bus. Their war in China had come to a standstill, but they wanted to keep expanding their sphere of influence and getting those sweet, sweet raw materials. They began making plans <laughs> to expand southward, but there was a problem. Oh, baby. Southeast Asia was heavily colonized by America and Great Britain. It was also full of ocean. Ocean meant naval combat, and there was no way the Japanese Navy could stand up to the U.S. and the U.K. <laughs> so they thought, wouldn't it be nice if we could destroy their navies before we begin our conquest? And so it was. On December 7th, 1941, the Japanese launched a surprise air raid on the U.S. Pacific fleet at Pearl Harbor and inflicted a huge amount of damage. They also attacked British colonies in Southeast Asia. Roosevelt had no choice but to declare war on Japan, and so did Churchill. Hitler then declared war on America, even though he totally didn't have to. The attack on Pearl Harbor seemed like a big Japanese victory, but they didn't attack any of the naval repair yards, tanks, or the submarine base. Yeah. Meaning the Pacific fleet would be up and running again pretty soon. In the meantime, though, the Japanese were able to begin their conquest. They took Guam, the Gilbert Islands, Wake Island, Hong Kong, and the Philippines. They forced Thailand to join them so they could march their troops through to Malaya. They swept through Singapore, North Borneo, the East Indies, New Guinea, the Solomons, and they were now threatening Northern Australia and the borders of India. Japan's victory had been as staggering as the Germans, and it reinforced the Japanese idea that this was a divine war which they were destined well, to Who's driving this thing? Based on uh -huh. speed, not yep. power, and power would eventually catch up with them. Mm -hmm. For now, though, in all occupied nations, the people suffered. Persecution, forced labor, harsh punishments for any who spoke out against their occupiers. In Europe, the Nazis were rounding up ethnic minorities and other unwanted groups and individuals. In particular, millions of Jewish people would suffer through the terrible events of the Holocaust. Brave resistance movements rose up in defiance of their invaders, while the people held out for hope. And hope was coming. Winter was over, and Hitler could continue his push eastward. But this time, he switched off his strategy. He wanted to focus on the south. His plan was to cut off the Russian armies in the Caucasus, an area full of oil, and then invade the Caucasus and take all the oil. His forces moved across the north with ease, and Hitler got cocky. 
He rerouted the 4th Panzer Army south early, leaving the 6th Army to complete the encircling movement alone. To do so, the 6th Army had to reach and take the key Soviet city of Stalingrad. The Russians defended it fiercely, and Stalingrad saw some of the harshest fighting of the entire war. The Soviets held up the German advance for five months as they battled in the war-torn city, which bought them valuable time. When the Germans had first launched their invasion a year earlier, the Soviets had moved their factories to the east, <laughs> had a ton of tanks and aircraft, and getting the Soviet Army up to scratch. Now, it was ready. Stalin gathered his new and improved forces around the city, and in an attack that resembled Hitler's own encirclement tactics, they began surrounding the 6th Army. Hitler's commanders came to him and said, hey, maybe we should retreat. But Hitler said, no, no, you stay. <laughs> the army was trapped and had to surrender. With complete air superiority, the Soviets started pushing westward. For Stalin, it was a resounding victory. For Hitler, an absolute catastrophe. Things also weren't looking too good for Hitler elsewhere. With America now in the war, Allied bombing over German cities reached devastating levels. In Africa, the British had pushed Rommel back again, then they were pushed back again, and finally, after a decisive battle at El Alamein, and with American and British troops arriving in the west, the Germans and Italians were squeezed out of Africa. Japan was also already seeing its rapid success being turned around. They attempted to take the island of Midway, but the U.S. Navy was ready for the attack, and they sank Japan's carrier. Actually, they sank a lot of them. It was a battle from which the Japanese Navy would never recover. British, Indian, and Chinese troops held the line in the harsh jungle terrain of Burma, and the Japanese suffered losses in the Solomon Islands and New Guinea. They began to realize they were not invincible. With the access out of Africa, the Allies had to decide their next move. Churchill still wanted to attack from the south, while the Americans preferred a full sea invasion in northern France. All right, said the Americans, we'll do it your way. Allied forces successfully landed in Sicily and began moving north. They also carried out bombing raids over Rome. The thing was, many of the people in Sicily had relatives living in America, and they greeted the American troops quite warmly. With the war reaching home territory, <laughs> most Italians just weren't that into it, and Mussolini was suddenly very unpopular. He was voted out by his own fascist grand council and was toppled from power. Italy immediately began negotiations for surrender. Hitler wasn't surprised and had already sent reinforcements southward. In an operation he ironically called Operation Axis, German troops quickly disarmed Italian troops in the north. The Allies continued fighting the Germans up through Italy, but then winter set in, meaning mud, and everything slowed to a halt. All right, said the Americans, let's do it our way as well. Germany had made itself a lot of enemies, and yep. millions of Allied troops had been gathering in England. Just screenshot because I'm lazy. For a super crazy massacre, the likes of which the world has never seen before in Holy smokes. The Allied invasion would come, but they didn't know where it would land. Thanks to Allied deception tactics, or when. they thought there was a pretty good chance it would come at Calais. But the Allies were really going to land in Normandy because it was less fortified and the beaches were nicer. Under the careful yeah. planning of General Boyd the Eisenhower, the invasion that had been long in the making was just about ready to go. Just one thing was preventing the launch, the British weather. For a short while, everyone sat around waiting for a decent day. And then, it came. On the night of June 5th, over a thousand bombers took off the raided coastline defenses, while paratroopers were dropped in on the British operation, <laughs> sabotaging defenses, and capturing key bridges to stop any German reinforcements from reaching the beaches. Early the next morning, the barrage came, as Allied ships fired a huge number of shells at the German fortifications. And then, the landings. The Americans yep. at Utah and Omaha, the British at Golden Sword, and the Canadians at Juneau. It was a tremendous struggle with a great loss of life, particularly mm -hmm. at Omaha, but the Allied troops captured the beaches and the landings were a success. Then they began their movements inland. They took the port of Cherbourg and the city of Caen. The Americans moved south to capture Brittany. Then, in a massive disaster for the Germans, British and Canadian troops from the north and Americans from the south trapped the German 7th Army in a near wipeout encircling region. In August, Allied troops landed in the south of France to little resistance. On one beach, all they found was a Frenchman handing out champagne. Paris was liberated and the Germans were pushed out of France as the Allies entered Belgium. In the Far East, the Allies started to push the Japanese out of Burma. As the Americans launched a two-pronged offensive in the Pacific, in the South, General MacArthur led the push to liberate the Philippines, while General Nimitz oversaw the brutal island-hopping campaign. American forces had to make hard-fought landing after hard-fought landing on fiercely defended small islands as they moved steadily towards the Japanese mainland. The Japanese believed that the greatest thing a person could do was to die in battle, and the most dishonorable act was to surrender. As a result, they fought ferociously to the very end, and the closer the Americans got to the mainland, the more ferocious the resistance became. In February, in 1945, the Americans captured the island of Iwo Jima, and an intense firebombing campaign of Japan's wooden cities began. The Allies suffered some setbacks trying to liberate the Netherlands, but they were making progress and were now threatening the industrial heartland of Germany. His health, both mentally and physically, was rapidly deteriorating. Things were looking bad, and he was desperate. He said, We need to turn this thing around, and now it's just the truth. Remember a few years back when we blitzkrieg through the Ardennes and trapped the Allied forces in Belgium? Well, I'm going to do the exact same thing again. 
He gathered his forces and tried to pound them through the Ardennes. He used up the remainder of Germany's strength and resources, and he managed to create quite a nice bulge. He also trapped some American forces in the Belgian town of Baston. The Germans sent the trapped Americans a message saying, surrender or be annihilated. When it was read out to the commanding officer, he said, they want to surrender? No, sir, they want us to surrender. Nuts! And that's what they sent off as their official reply. The General Patton's third army then managed to break the troops from the southwest, and the Germans were pushed back. Hitler's last ditch attempt had failed, and what followed was a total collapse of the German forces. The Allies pushed into Germany from both sides. The Soviet Union took Warsaw and kept pushing to Berlin. In his bunker, Hitler realized all hope was lost. Berlin fell, and with it, Hitler's dreams of a great German empire. Two of the Axis nations had been knocked out, one to go. The Americans began their assault on Okinawa, the last island before they would reach the Japanese mainland. The desperate Japanese fought hard, launching kamikaze attacks on the U.S. ships. The citizens of Okinawa suffered through the terrible fighting, but in two months, the island was captured. The Allies now had to make a choice, either continue the devastating struggle up the Japanese mainland, or they could try to coerce the Japanese into surrendering now. In July, the first successful atomic bomb test took place in New Mexico, and the destructive weapon was ready for use. America and the UK were also seeing the Soviet Union not so much liberating as occupying its captured territory, and so they wanted to put on a show of force. On August 6th, the A-bomb fell on Hiroshima. Then, on the 9th, Nagasaki. The cities were reduced to rubble, and for the people living there, it was a terrible thing. But for the Allies, it achieved their main aim. In September, the Emperor announced Japan's surrender, saying the war situation has developed not necessarily to Japan's advantage. After six years, the war was finally over. The Allies occupied Japan for eight years. The Emperor was allowed to keep his position, but General MacArthur made sure this picture was printed in the Japanese press to display to the Japanese people that their Emperor was not the divine, powerful being they had believed. Germany was divided between America, the UK, France, and the Soviet Union. In 1949, the Allied sectors were united into West Germany. The Second World War had been more terrible and destructive than the first. In its aftermath, two major superstars with two very different ideologies had come out victorious, and the tension between the two of them would create a new kind of war. A very, very cold one. Wow, Churchill, that looks just like me. And your app is doing really well. And this quesadilla you made is to die for. How'd you learn to do all this stuff? I used the link. <laughs>